Hi, I'm Kenneth Miller from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and this panel is Geography and Partisan Polarization. Uh, we're going to be running from 4 to 5.45 p.m. Eastern, or for those of us on the West Coast, 1 o'clock to 2.45. We have four papers on this panel. Each one is going to give us a 15-minute presentation. And after that, we will have a Q&A. Audience members can submit questions via the chat function that appears on the right side of your screen. And we will run through that after these presentations are concluded. If you're interested in reading the bios of these presenters today and looking at copies of these papers, those are available on the conference website. So our first presentation of four today is from Anthony Sparacino. I'm very sorry if I pronounced that. And he's coming to us from the University of Richmond. This paper is State Level Elected Officials, National Party Organizations, and Partisan Polarization in 2020. Uh, Professor Spirocino, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Moon, thanks very much. And I'll just pull up, I have a few slides, but they're mainly just to give folks something to look at besides me um, while I do this. So um, I'll try pulling these up here. And hopefully you guys can see those. Yes. Great. Um, again, so uh, thanks, Dr. Miller, for the introduction, and thanks to you know the other panelists and everybody who's um, attending here today. Um, so um, over the course of you know the day so far, and then into tomorrow, um, I think we're going to learn a lot about the ways in which uh, the 2020 election cycle was unique. Um, you know, for example, they were held, I would say, overall rather successfully within the context of a global pandemic. Um, Mail-in balloting exploded. The nature of campaigning uh, changed dramatically, um, and turnout reached levels not seen in decades. Um, and in on you know, a more pessimistic note, the aftermath of the elections I think was probably just as important as what occurred on election day, um, from a certain perspective. Um, from my perspective, um, someone who's interested in American social development. Um, one thing that stood out to me about this particular election cycle um, was that state level elected officials, um, in particular governors, but also state's attorneys general, um, and even to some extent local election administrators, um, were prominent players um, in this in the story of 2020. Um, and I have to admit that even um, being a, a political scientist who's interested in federalism, um, before 2020, I had no idea who Brad Raffensperger or Gabriel Sterling were. Um, I had never heard of them before. I'm not from the Peach State. I'm native of New York, from New York, and li now live in Virginia. Um, congrats to the Braves, by the way. I'm a Mets fan, so that kind of disappointed me as well. But that's a conversation for another day. Um, but I think the fact that you know these individuals, um, the, the fact that they came to draw so much attention. Um, you know, not just within this within their respective states, but across the country, I think is illustrative of the extent to which the American party system has become integrated and nationalized. And party nationalization has been, you know, long term trends that APD scholars have focused on for some time. Right. We sort of, you know, many of us kind of find the roots of this trend uh, of this you know, phenomenon in, you know, uh, for Klingard, it's intraparty contestation between presidents and party factions. Um, we look to the prog progressive era reforms, the assault on local party organizations, the emergence of the American state during the New Deal, your tra a transformed media landscape. And one thing I emphasize um, is the rise of a new party organizational form, um, but among other factors. Um, and I think it's fair to say that 2020 sort of extended this trend. Um, but I think what was unique here um, was that you know despite what was going on so much activity going on in the states the elections i would say were still very nationalized and i think the activities of these state level elected officials were important in 2020 because rather than in spite of a hyper nationalized political environment um so I believe the extent to which the 2020 elections were nationalized can be demonstrated um, basically in three ways. Um, so I examine um, uh, how partisanship structured state officials um, across state lines during the campaign season, um, in particular in terms of policy implemented and how those policies were characterized within the campaign cycle. Um, I discuss um, in the paper a bit about be the behavior of the electorate on election day, 
Um, but again, also, I think one of the, uh, you know, applying it to what I think is sort of the most unique feature of this particular election cycle, the role state actors played in dealing with President Trump's response to the election. Um, so two issues that featured prominently during the 2020 campaign cycle um, that I think had significant implications for state and local governance were um, the response to the COVID-19 pandemic um, and then racial justice protests after the death of George Floyd. Um, so regarding uh, the COVID response, um, in effect, there were you know, 50 different responses to the pandemic across 50 states um, and certainly even more diversity within states. Um, right, America's federated constitutional design still allows for a great deal of diversity and policies adopted across the country, um, but national partisanship quickly came to structure state level responses to the pandemic with fairly distinctive patterns emerging based on which party was in power within the states, um, especially which party controlled the governor's mansion. Um, so for instance, states with Democratic governors tended to implement stay at home orders or shelter in place orders um, earlier and keep them in place for longer um, than states with GOP governors. Mask mandates were also more stringent in states controlled by Democrats and even changes to voting laws at the state level leading into the election and again in response to the pandemic, um, we saw some variation there in terms of a state's partisan leanings with democratically controlled states more likely to say increase access to mail-in balloting or set up drop boxes and, and, um, and early, you know, uh, expand early voting opportunities. Um, in this way, um, to use a phrase from um, Jessica Pullman, Bowman Posen's um, article, states acted like laboratories of partisan democracy. Um, the difference in states' responses to the pandemic, I think, became part of the National Party's campaign messaging. So Democrats in the, in, in the states and at the national level were quick to criticize President Trump and Republican governors for not taking the pandemic seriously enough and not, quote unquote, following the science. So organizations like the Democratic Governors Association issued numerous statements criticizing Republican candidates, um, for instance, including uh, Missouri Governor Mike Parson for holding crowded, largely maskless campaign events and Democratic critiques of Republican governors mirrored those made of President Trump. Um, so for instance, again, another example here, former governor, I guess former disgraced governor Andrew Cuomo, who went to the same high school as I did, just, I don't know what that says about me, but throwing it out there. Um, in a speech at the DNC, he noted that uh, only a strong body can fight off the virus and America's divisions weakened it. Donald Trump didn't create the initial division, the division created Trump. He only made it worse. Our collective strength is exercised through government. It is in effect our immune system and our current federal government is dysfunctional and incompetent. It couldn't fight off the virus. In fact, it didn't even see it coming. And largely, and there's something to this, the burden of fighting the virus, at least in Cuomo's view, did in many ways fall to the states. Now, President Trump and Republicans for their part criticized Democrats for strict lockdown policies the president sent out several tweets urging governors to liberate their respective states, despite his own administration still being in the midst of the 30 days to slow the spread campaign. Um, personal freedom and reviving the economy became something of a focal point in the messaging of Republicans across multiple levels of government. And the president's Republican allies also criticized Democratic governors and mayors for their responses to the protests that occurred in the, after the killing of George Floyd. And a consistent theme of the messaging coming out, for instance, of the Republican Governors Association um, was that Democratic governors and mayors in, and I quote, Democrat run cities um, were weak on crime, perhaps even backing efforts to defund the police. Now, President Trump in accepting the nomination, again, there's a parallel here, noted that, and I quote, American voter votes will decide whether we protect law abiding Americans or whether we give free reign to violent anarchist agitators and criminals who threaten our citizens. And even plans for the national party conventions implicated state and local officials in kind of odd ways. So Democrats moved nearly all of their convention activities to a virtual format, um, with Joe Biden being the first Democrat to accept the party's nomination remotely, I believe since FDR. President Trump's preference to host a more traditional in-person event 
um, had the RNC make preparations to shift most of their programming from North Carolina, which had a Democratic governor, um, to Florida, where um, Republican Governor Ron DeSantis had taken a much more lenient approach to coronavirus restrictions um, before eventually deciding to have Trump deliver his acceptance speech um, from the White House. Now on election day, uh, partisanship, I can believe played a central role in structuring voting behavior up and down the ballot. Um, and I think exit polling uh, demonstrates that attitudes regarding state level officials responses to the pandemic and issues of racial justice um, strongly correlated with national partisan orientations. So state level races again in, in 2020 were something of a, I would say a major concession prize to Republicans um, as they lost control of the presidency and the Senate um, and Democrats retained um, the House of Representatives, albeit at a by a fairly narrow margin. Now, for instance, um, Republican Greg Gianforte um, won uh, to become governor of Montana in the state Trump won handily. Um, in the 11 states holding gubernatorial elections, eight of the party's presidential and gubernatorial candidates both win. Um, the three exceptions here were Vermont, uh, New Hampshire, and North Carolina. Now, in Vermont and New Hampshire, the Republican Republicans ran incumbents Phil Scott and Chris Sununu. Um, and both of them were able to win over a fairly substantial percentage of Democratic voters um, and both received fairly solid marks for their handling of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, this was definitely not true for President Trump in those in those respective states. Um, and in North Carolina, uh, Governor Cooper held a seat against, I believe it was uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Forrest. Um, uh, while Trump carried the state, but these were, um, these were fairly close uh, elections. Um, and a similar pattern emerged in state attorneys general's races with only one of 10 contests that were held, um, seeing a difference between the party that won the state at the presidential level and in the state attorneys general's race. Again, this was also in uh, North Carolina, I believe, with a margin of less than 15,000 votes. Um, and perhaps again, the most what I think is probably the most unique feature of the 2020 campaign cycle with regard to party nationalization um, was the extent to which state level officials were implicated after the results, or I guess while the results were being tallied and then even after that. Um, and I think two sets of actors, I think bear particular attention here, uh, states attorneys generals and, and state legislatures. Um, so Republicans attorneys general um, led by uh, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton filed um, the case Texas versus Pennsylvania, um, in which they argue that the results of se several states carried by President Biden should be declared void because of unconstitutional changes to election laws um, made in, in light of the pandemic. And the initial bill of complaint noted that, and I'm quoting here, non-legislative actors purported amendments to states duly enacted election laws in violation of the electors clauses vesting state legislatures with plenary authority regarding the appointment of presidential electors. So 16 other states attorneys, or GOP as states attorneys general um, signed on to the lawsuit um, and an amicus brief, uh, an amicus brief filled, uh, uh, signed by over 100 GOP members of Congress is also filed. And I think this you know, potentially added um, an air of legitimacy uh, to the case, at least in the minds of certain voters within the Republican Party. Um, you know, the case ultimately was not heard. I have a little, um, just a image there of, of the, 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 the Supreme Court's response. Um, but President Trump referred to this case at one point as the big one. Um, and the court, again, ultimately preserved, I think in this case, state prerogative in determining um, their own election procedures blocking states effectively from being able to challenge the election results of other states. Um, but nevertheless, in the in the case of you know, Republicans attorneys general, um, they were using state resources here to further the ambitions of the National Party, specifically President Trump. Um, and I believe that you know, this case wound up you know, having more of an effect in the court of public opinion than it did in the actual court system. Um, also, state legislatures, I think, were implicated in President Trump's response to the election, um, particularly in Arizona, right? Uh, several, um, they you know, initiated a, a quote unquote audit. Every time I read about these things, there's always a, the old word audit is always in quotes. Um, 
but the state Senate in Arizona um, allowed one of these to uh, investigate claims of fraud. Um, the Arizona State Senate, led by Ken Farron, hired a little known firm, Cyber Ninjas, to conduct a recount of Maricopa County. And the methods employed by the auditors have been criticized, um, as has the fact that most of the funding for these audits um, seem to be coming from private donors. So, for instance, in Arizona, the State Senate only approved $150,000 for the effort. Um, and now audits have been proposed in at least Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, and I believe now it's it's it seems to be spreading. Um, other states are 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 call, uh, state legislators and other states are calling for these as well. Um, but I think the important point here is that um, the state senate here is using its investigatory powers to further partisan aims, um, even though the audit again has no chance at reversing the results of the election in the state. Um, and despite the audit ultimately not finding widespread evidence of fraud, in fact, uh, the recounts that was conducted found that Biden won the county by a slightly larger margin than the official results. Um, hearings held by the state Senate here highlighted these spurious claims and just you know is propelling the myth. Um, so state resources, again, state um, legislatures, powers are being used um, to further these national partisan aims. And ultimately, the actions of state actors became the subject of intense scrutiny during the campaign cycle. Um, the actions taken by governors um, aligned with national partisan campaign narratives, even during a global pandemic where cooperation among levels of government was vital. National partisan affiliation structured vote choice down ballot, um, and significantly, I think state level elected officials continued to play a role in furthering partisan warfare after the votes were tallied. And again, I think in a you know, point to note here is obviously state legislatures and state governments, you know, in, after, especially after um, after the results at the end of the decade when they're redistricting. Um, I think at that point that seems like normal normal partisan warfare at this point. I think the, the implication is that they're using their powers in kind of new ways um, in, in order to further to further these aims. Um, now, to be sure, and I'll end like maybe this is sort of on a reassuring note here, um, when it counted, state prerogative was asserted. So in Arizona, your Republican Governor Doug Ducey did sign off on the state's official election results, um, but he's taken some heat from President Trump for doing so. Um, and in Georgia, Secretary of State Raffensperger um, rejected stuff, Trump's calls to find enough votes to flip the state. Um, however, again, the extent to which the election was contested and the media attention placed on these officials um, whose roles in elections are often invisible to the average voter, I think illustrates the extent to which partisan competition has nationalized. And I'll just end on uh, a note. It, it feels probably all too commonplace for political scientists to quote former Speaker of the, you know, of the House Tip O'Neill, all politics is local, um, but I'll put my little spin on this here. Um, in my view, I think the 2020 election was one in which states and localities were merely local venues for national politics. So um, thanks, and I guess I'll um, try to turn over the turn the floor back over here if I could figure out how to do that. All right. Uh, thank you, Professor Sparacino. Uh, our second paper today is J. Michael Bitzer is going to be presenting a co-authored work with Christopher Cooper, Whitney Ross Manzo, and Susan Roberts. This is the rise of the unaffiliated voter in North Carolina. So the floor is yours. So this is a um, kind of a beginning of a long-term uh, project that the four of us are very interested in. Uh, about North Carolina. We are all in North Carolina and we all work for a blog that we all write for, Old North State Politics. And over time, what we have seen is this incredible rise of unaffiliated registered voters in the state. And so what we wanted to do is put together a kind of preliminary analysis and hopefully get some comments and some feedback uh, on how this project is working out and what could be some potential future explorations because one of the key points that we'll make is that at some point in the not too distant future most likely next year unaffiliated registered voters will be the largest voter block in the state of north carolina and so a little bit of background about what we know about unaffiliated voters certainly going back to the american voter 
the idea of voters who describe themselves as independents, not really the idealized voter that uh, the researchers then uh, came to discover. Over time, what we have seen is from other researchers distinctions made about so-called independent voters, the distinctions of those who lean to one party as opposed to the pure independents who could potentially be the classic swing voters. Uh, certainly some characteristics, less informed, less engaged, perhaps more moderate. Uh, what we are looking at is with North Carolina, a kind of getting a little bit more of a nuanced understanding of unaffiliated voters, what we could potentially think of as independent voters. Are they truly independent? And most importantly, the fact that as we have seen nationally, independents are steadily increasing. Both Pew and Gallup have documented this continued rise, whether you describe them as leaners or pure independents, these folks are continuing to dominate in terms of the political identity across the country and in states. The case for using North Carolina is that we are a semi-closed primary state. Uh, both parties by invitation uh, allow unaffiliated voters the opportunity to participate in one of the primaries, but they can't uh, participate in both. They have to pick one. We are indeed as a state kind of average in terms of our demographics, but we are intensely, as Anthony noted, a competitive political battleground state. Donald Trump won by less than two points. Uh, U.S. Senator Tom Tillis about the same, but then we have Democratic uh, incumbent Governor Roy Cooper win by again two to three percentage points. This has been the case since 2008 when Barack Obama flipped North Carolina from being a 12 point Republican state in 2004 to less than half a percentage point in 2008. And really the state has continued in this competitive dynamic for some time. We also have the luxury of data availability, both in terms of number of polling outfits in the state. We're gonna be relying on one of our colleagues, uh, Whitney Ross Manzo in the Meredith poll for this data for this project but also data that is from the North Carolina State Board of Elections. So the primary questions that we were interested in, in doing in terms of this first uh, stab at this analysis of the unaffiliated voter in North Carolina, how much have they grown over time in terms of North Carolina and the registered voter numbers? Secondly, how do they compare to the two major parties? We have registered Democrats, we have registered Republicans, registered unaffiliated. We also have registered Libertarians. At one time, we had members of the Constitution Party and the Green Party. They did not meet a threshold in the 2020 election. So those voters have been shifted into unaffiliated. So we basically have in the state four registration statuses that a voter can pick. And then finally, what is the political behavior? The voter uh, patterns, what are some of the policy preferences of these North Carolina unaffiliated registrants? So the data comes from two primary sources. First off, it's the administrative data from the North Carolina State Board of Elections. Now in North Carolina, you can gain access every Saturday to the entire voter registration file from the State Board of Elections and can look at who has registered along with a substantial amount of demographic details along with locations, where they reside, what precincts they vote in. Another key data file that we are using in this particular uh, project is what's called the voter history data file and every voter who goes to cast a ballot in North Carolina in an election is recorded. That election is recorded, 
the vote method is recorded, how they voted in terms of whether it was absentee by mail, absentee in person, which is called one stop in the state, or on election day, or provisional, uh, any form of votes being cast, that is recorded as well. So we were able to take the voter registration data for various presidential elections, combine that with the voter history data to see among those who are registered and affiliated a number of different areas. The second data uh, that we're using in this project is indeed from the Meredith poll. The 2018 and 2019 polls were done in a classic hybrid, both uh, calls and online. The 2021 version due to COVID was strictly online. To get into the data uh, that we're going to be presenting here, this goes back to 1977 when the General Assembly authorized the establishment of a classification known as unaffiliated. That took a number of those voters that were then registered as independents, grouped them together, and started the unaffiliated status in the state. Now you'll notice from 1977 up to the present, a distinct trend going on. And in particularly, I would point to two lines. The first line is in 1988, when the Republican Party, after the state legislature gave the authorization to the political parties, opened up their primary to unaffiliated to be able to cast ballots in their primary. It wasn't until 1996 that the Democratic Party did the same. And so what we have seen over time from the 19, late 1970s was unaffiliated voters were typically less than 5% of the voter registration pool. But once the Republicans opened up and then certainly the Democrats a number of years later, that number has only continued to go up. Among registered Democrats, they have dropped from the high, from the mid 70s down to right now about 36% of the voter pool. Republicans reached a high point of about 35% in the early 2000s. They have settled to about 30% of the pool. And right now, unaffiliated voters are around 33 to 34% of the entire pool of registered voters. North Carolina right now has about seven and a half million registered voters. So in taking this data and being able to isolate who are the unaffiliated voters for the past four presidential uh, elections, <clears throat> we're kind of able to look at demographics and we are able to uh, code each voter based on race and ethnicity. So we have in 2008 among unaffiliated voters about 80% white non-Hispanic, 11% black African-American non-Hispanic, Hispanic Latinos about 2%, and then all others about seven. But as we know over time, both nationally and here in North Carolina, uh, demographics have certainly diversified from the 2012 to the 2016 to the most recent 2020 election, unaffiliated are generally much more of a mirror of the general population of registered voters in the state. Now, I should add a comment here. You will notice that among the unknown or unreported, it jumped from 6% in 2016 to 14% in 2020. Due to COVID, the State Board of Elections decided to host an online portal through the North Carolina Division of Motor Vehicles that allowed people to register online, but they did not ask for race or ethnicity data. They were gonna go back and fill that in based on driver's license data. We're still waiting for that data to be updated. To compare unaffiliated voters to the registered partisans, first democratic voters have become the party of majority minority. Back in 2008, 54% of Democrats were white, non-Hispanic. That has dropped down to 40%. Black African-American non-Hispanics to 45, and Hispanic Latinos up to 4%. To compare also to Republican voters, 
very much a strong white non-Hispanic group. But again, you'll notice the un, uh, known unreported jump from 1% to 7%. That will be interesting to see the dynamics of if they are able to capture that data, does that number reshift back up to perhaps white non-Hispanic voters? In terms of asking which primaries these unaffiliated registered voters prefer in North Carolina, we see changes over time over the past four presidential cycles, but it's mainly due to the competitiveness of that particular presidential cycle. In 2008, the contest basically got decided in North Carolina's May primary. Three quarters of the unaffiliated that voted in the primary voted Democratic. But in 2012 and 2016, they tended to prefer the Republican ballot, but flipped back in 2020 on Super Tuesday to basically two thirds of unaffiliated voters picking the Democratic over the Republican uh, primary. In terms of looking at those unaffiliated voters, we decided to specifically look at how did the voters who consistently voted in the 2012, 2016, and 2020 party primaries, how did they differ? And for both party primaries, we've actually got a fairly uh, interesting population of about 113,000 evenly divided between the two parties. Now, not surprisingly, whites tended to vote more in the Republican Party. Blacks, uh, non-Hispanic, tended to vote overwhelmingly in the Democratic Party. Hispanic Latinos were 74% in the Democratic Party. And then all other race and ethnicities were generally at least 60 to typically 70% picking the Democratic uh, Party ticket. There is a gender divide in, not surprisingly, females more on the Democratic side, males on the Republican side. We could look at generational cohorts. Millennials in Generation X tended to vote more consistently uh, in the Democratic Party, but older voters, boomers, and the greatest and silent generation tended to be in the Republican primary. We also looked at where these voters resided, central cities and urban suburbs, more democratic, surrounding suburbs, and also rural counties, more Republican. In terms of the Meredith poll data, we asked about uh, how the voters tended to look at the satisfaction in terms of the direction of the country. Not surprisingly, during a Republican administration, Democrats were unhappy about the direction, but once Biden came in, they were happy. Republicans, the exact opposite. But for unaffiliated voters, those who identified as registered unaffiliated, they tended to be sour in all administrations. We also asked two policy questions. How important about raising income in households over 400,000? Overwhelmingly, Democrats were said it was a critical, important. Republicans uh, more evenly spread out amongst the choices. Unaffiliated tended to be, again, the bridge between the two in terms of how they viewed this policy area, as well as free community college. Again, Democrats were overwhelmingly saying critical or important. Republicans, a plurality of them said that that wasn't important, but unaffiliated tended to, again, be kind of spread over. The final data that we're looking at is how do unaffiliated compare to partisans in terms of their tendency to vote. And what we did was we took all North Carolina's 2700 precincts and broke them down into reports for two party vote for Biden and Trump. And then what was the registered electorate composition based on party registration? We then run scatter plots for both the partisan registered voters and the unaffiliated voters. So if you take all of the precincts and look at the percentage of the composition of Democrats within the precinct compared to Biden's performance in the precincts, a pretty close relationship between the two among Republicans and Donald Trump, it was even more so at a higher relationship level but when we looked at unaffiliated for how they dispersed in terms of the Trump vote, 
it was no relationship, but a slight uptick in terms of the slope. So to kind of bring this together, the, the discussion in terms of the remarkable growth of North Carolina's unaffiliated voters, it will likely be next year that we will see the largest registration group among registered unaffiliated. They tend to be a bridge, both demographically and policy oriented. And what's interesting is the comparable numbers of consistent voters and party primaries, we think re reflecting an intense competitive nature. And then finally, one question that we are thinking about in the future, how will the political parties react to this continuing growth and the future dynamics of unaffiliated voters? And with that, I will turn the floor back over. This is Blue Metro's Red States, the geography of the 2020 vote in the swing states. Uh, this is being presented by David Demore. It's also co-authored by Karen Danielson and Robert Lang. Go ahead, David. Sorry about that. Thank you. No problem um, on that. You know, new technology. I hear you. Um, so last year, last fall, uh, three of us published a book called Blue Metro's Red States, the shifting urban rural divide in America's uh, swing states. And the question we're trying to figure out in that book is sort of this issue of not red state, blue state, but within states, the red and blue uh, tensions there. So we're looking at interstate demographic, economic, partisan and sociocultural differences between large metros and the balance of their states. And we're obviously looking at electoral outcomes, but also uh, state policy making as well there. Um, so to our selection criteria um, was essentially a 2016 statewide election margin of 10 points or less. And your state had to have at least one um, MSA census designated MSA with a population of a million or more. So this, uh, the second criteria there knocks out Iowa, Maine, and uh, New Hampshire, which were within 10 points, but don't have a big metro. So we end up with 13 swing states um, with a combined 27 uh, million plus metros there. And the way this shapes up, as we'll talk about in a little bit, is there's a real big Sun Belt, uh, Rust Belt dynamic at work in here. And then the book, what we do is we look at data um, from 2012 to 2018. Um, the basic argument we make in the book is that these tensions are shaped by a number of interrelated factors. Uh, the first is sort of settlement patterns that affect the um, sociocultural values related to diversity, both in terms of exposure and acceptance. Um, we talk also a lot about the demographic and economic sorting between big metros versus the rest of the state in terms of diversity, as well as the concentration of economic activity in big metros relative to their the rest of the states. We look at how changing uh, or the rise, I should say, of uh, social cultural issues related to race and diversity um, acceptance, um, how those have sort of led to attitudinal polarization. The last thing we look at is the role of institutions, obviously things like the Electoral College and the equal apportionment of the U.S. Senate um, at, the, at the federal level, but also things like home rule, the level of metro fragmentation and how that plays into um, state politics there, and particularly how these institutions tend to work against the interests of the big metros there. So borrowing from Ron Brownstein, we argue that essentially what you're seeing in American politics right now is a decoupling of economic and demographic power from political power. Um, and more generally, what we see is the Democratic coalition is being driven by dense density, that is dense uh, urban spaces where you have high levels of diversity and increasingly the movement of college educated uh, white voters towards the Democratic Party there. We also make the argument, which I'll touch on here in a little bit, that because these million plus metros are so big that when they and if they do vote cohesively, there is not enough votes in the rest of the state to offset the metro vote. Now, as we'll see, there's a variation across the states we look at in that dynamic. So if we go forward to 2020, we were very happy with the results because they played into our book um, quite nicely. Um, so Biden ends up flipping five states to win the presidency in all uh, but four of the 27 large metros we look at his uh, vote total his vote share increases uh, you also tend up seeing that a lot of these um, big metros also increase their vote share relative to the rest of their states 
We clearly see uh, across the Sun Belt, these dynamics are very, very um, strong um, in, in outside of Florida. Um, and then a data point that we came across was that in the lower 48 states, Biden wins every single state where there is a metro that constitutes, a single metro constitutes more than half of the state's population. Um, in 2016, Clinton won them all besides Arizona and Georgia, but those are two of the states that flipped. So this got us thinking about how do we extend this argument here and looking at this idea of how does scale of the metro affect the level of cohesion we see in the metros. So in the paper, we end up reviewing a lot of the sort of literature on tolerance um, and also looking at some of the, the literature on um, housing segregation and trying to figure out what's the best level to sort of see these effects there. Um, and we argue that it's at the metro level. Um, it's large enough and there's obviously by definition um, high levels of social and economic integration there. We also know that uh, the, the principal cities of metros are able to project um, to the suburbs and to the outlying rural areas through telecom, through transportation, and of course through media. Um, we also know that if the metro is big enough, it can support large new subcultures, new attitudes, and this tends to develop common interests that can spell out, spill over into political behavior. And then we also know that metros are complex, right? They, they're, 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 they're heterogeneous. No one group tends to dominate an entire metro. You end up with greater pluralism in decision making. You get exposed residents to uh, contexts that reinforce social integration and diversity acceptance in order just to make the metros work there. So that's sort of the basis of the, the background that we're trying to pull this issue of scale and why we expect scale to exert some effects, um, some political effects in voting behavior. So the analysis we present in the paper, we essentially compare what happened in 2016 to 2020 in the swing states in the million plus metros. We end up looking at the presidential margin. Um, we collect the data for the other statewide races as well, but I'm not gonna talk about those. Um, and we also then looking at interesting the change in the total vote share. Did the metros become, did their vote carry more weight in 2020 relative to 2016 there? So if we look, sort of look at the inter, uh, the uh, intermetro variation, we clearly see, as I mentioned in the intro, a Sun Belt versus Rust, Rust Belt dynamic. Um, and as we're going to see, Florida screws everything up for us, um, but that's the way Florida works um, on that. Um, we also clearly see this difference between the sort of single metro versus multi-metro state, right? So Biden again wins all five of the metros where, or the states where you have a single metro that's half the population, but he splits on the multi-metro states. Um, they both, he and Trump end up winning four of those um, states there. And we'll talk about why that might be the case here in a minute. So we take a look at the data here. So what these are, are the metro swings from 2016 uh, to 2020 here, ranked from the most Republican swing to the most Democratic swing uh, within the MSAs there. And so again, you see 23 of the 27 metros, Biden improves his vote share rel relative to uh, Clinton. Uh, the outliers are Miami, um, even though uh, Biden still carries Miami, he loses 11 points off of um, uh, uh, Clinton's total there. Jacksonville was an interesting case for us because we expected Jacksonville as the metro to move more blue. You clearly see Biden does carry the Duval County where Jacksonville is, but all the surrounding areas become much, much more uh, Republican there, and that ends up canceling out there. Um, and you see a negligible movement towards the Republicans in Cleveland um, and Las Vegas. Then as you go down, you clearly see they go from pretty competitive in Tampa, not much of a change there, a little bit of a growth in Orlando, and then you get down into where you see the big swings in some of the states that swung, obviously uh, Tucson and Phoenix in particular. Um, and then what's interesting, of course, is the, 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 the biggest swings were in Atlanta, Dallas, and Austin. Uh, those had the biggest swings um, there, and obviously we know what's going on in Texas. In the last two cycles, the Democrats have gone from a 16-point loss to a six-point loss um, in those states there. And then in 16 of the 27 metros, uh, the vote share increased. That is, the metro share of the vote accounted for more of the state total than it did compared to 2016. Some of these were negligible, but at some point you see a, a, an increase of a point or two. Um, so if Biden's not only winning 
a bigger share of the metro vote and the metro vote sharing and having a bigger impact on the vote that's kind of a two for punch if you think about it um, that way also in the paper then we sort of say okay well what happened outside of the metros so i know this is a little busy um table uh, the figure on the left for 2016 recreate out of the book and then we just do the same thing for 2020. so what we do here in this figure is we put together all the metro vote um, so if you're a multi-metro, we, we combine your vote in there. And then we look at sort of the rest of state, which is all the counties outside of the million plus metros. And then we look at sort of what happened on the statewide margin there. Um, so a couple of things obviously jump out. You just see how big the disparity is in the voting between the million plus metros being so democratic versus the rest of the states, which are not. Um, you also saw sort of got less reporting um, in the aftermath of 2020, but Biden did well outside the metros as well. He cut uh, the margins outside of every state except for Ohio and Texas. Those are the two states where Trump's um, metro non-metro share grew. And of course, in Texas, a lot of that was on the border where you saw a lot of heavy Latino communities that had gone more heavily for, for Clinton uh, cut their, uh, Trump was able to cut their margins um, out there. So we do sort of see, yes, that, yeah, Biden also his victory was due outside of the metros. But I think the big point here of this table is just to see how much of this divergence you see uh, between the metros and the rest of their states um, there. So what is our sort of takeaways from our papers here? The first is obviously, if you look at the data and you read it in the paper, you clearly see that, you know, where there's more density, where there's more diversity, where it's fast growing, where it's urbanizing. And this is essentially those Sunbelt metros um, all the way from Virginia into Denver, um, across to, into to Phoenix and Las Vegas. You see that is the growth power for, for, for the, uh, the where the Democrats are going to grow. Relative to 26, you can think that Clinton sort of gets caught between the emerging Sunbelt and the fading Rust Belt there. Um, one of the sort of interesting data points we came across as we were looking into this is that all five of those states where a single metro accounts for 50% of the state's population, they now are all, those Senate seats are held by Democrats. In the last two cycles, six of those flipped, right? You have the two, the, the two in Arizona and Georgia, Colorado had a flip, Nevada had a flip. And in the Rust Belt, it's just Minnesota um, where you have that dynamic in, pla in place here. When we look at the scale, it's very less sort of clear cut, right? You clearly look at say like Florida, North Carolina, where the sort of urban space is very, very fragmented, fragmented across multiple metros. You also have a lot of number, large uh, metro regions that are below the million threshold, but still have significant chunks of that. And sort of one of the things we sort of argue in the paper is that it's harder to make this sort of, see that dynamic in play, right? Um, there's a, funny well, funny graphic that uh, is in we, we've seen in Nevada and Pennsylvania but the one in Nevada says make Nevada great and essentially says build a wall around Las Vegas um, so that dynamic of that Las Vegas is the other Atlanta is the other it's different from the rest of the state that creates in our mind some sort of idea of some sort of unitary notion that hey it's Vegas it's Atlanta versus the rest of our state here we got to hang together um, in order to get our preferences heard here so the next steps of this project are essentially to begin to look within these million plus metros are what are the best suburban targets for, for both parties there? What are the suburban characteristics that make met, uh, some suburbs uh, more appealing to Democrats and more appealing to Republicans? So obviously there's the inner core versus outer core, but we're also looking at some of the factors that sort of leading to increase urbanization and the urban feel of some of these um, major metros, that is the, the growth of light rail, infill through vertical um, building versus the outer suburbs that tend to be much less diverse and tend to attract a different type of a uh, of, uh, of voter out there where you're interested in large single family homes and that kind of stuff so obviously we saw in virginia republicans recover some of their uh, suburban turf here we want to know is there a systematic way we can sort of predict which of these suburbs are going to move one way or the other in a given election cycle um, so that's where uh, we are right now with the project um, so stay tuned and hopefully it'll be done by the time the next election comes around. Um, so with that, I will turn it back over uh, to Ken to, if I can figure out how to do this. <laughs> Terrific.
Sure. Uh, okay, so our fourth paper for this panel is from John C. Davis at the University of Arkansas at Monticello, Turning the Natural State Red, the Rise of the GOP in Arkansas. So John, floor is yours. Uh, so uh, the project uh, is, is called uh, From Blue to Red, the Rise of the Republican Party in Arkansas. And um, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that a lot of the data that are being used for a larger book length project um, with a, a similar working title uh, would not be possible if it wasn't for the collaboration with the David and, and Barbara Pryor Center for Arkansas Oral and Visual History. They, right before the pandemic, uh, reached out to me and we began a, a collaborative effort that was, of course, interrupted by the pandemic. Uh, that involved interviewing uh, numerous people uh, from our current former governors uh, to campaign managers to political scientists and reporters to try to capture something that has happened uh, that, that really over the last just few election cycles. 2020 um, caps off the most successful uh, decade, politically speaking, for the Republican Party in Arkansas uh, in the modern era. Uh, and so it, we, we've had some quick sort of hot takes uh, that have discussed this. And, and um, what I've found in, in my research is that I think the story, the narrative is a little, a little more complex and a little more in depth, a little more de um, deeper uh, than what we typically would consider in terms of maybe 2010, everything changes and we blame Barack Obama and we move on. I, there's a little bit more to it. And so what I've done is I have um, broken up um, what I call the three generations of the Republican Party in Arkansas. Uh, and it begins in 66 um, with the state's first Republican governor, uh, Winthrop Rockefeller, um, who was elected in 66, re-elected in 68, loses in 70, um, and unfortunately passes away um, shortly thereafter. Uh, Winrock uses his vast Rockefeller fortune to build a GOP in Arkansas. Um, he believes strongly in a two-party system in a state that um, famously had been seen by V.O. Key as uh, perhaps the most single one party form and its most undefiled state or, or something like that. So this was a state that was heavily democratic, even among other heavily democratic southern states. And when the Rockefeller surprises a great many people uh, with a unique coalition of uh, progressives uh, who are um, disenchanted with the Favis regime, this, this decades long um, uh, power center uh, that are displeased with the Democratic Party's um, sort of transferring of the mantle of power after Faubus with yet another conservative Democrat that doesn't seem to have a lot of new ideas. Um, African Americans that are becoming more and more um, active and relevant in the post Jim Crow, you know, the CRA um, Voting Rights Act era in the state. And so Rockefeller has this very unique uh, coalitional base of support um, that is based on him and not the GOP. So he does well um, and he doesn't have coattails. And this leads us into the 80s and 90s, or I'm sorry, 70s and 80s, where the Republican Party in Arkansas is sort of in the wilderness years, so to speak. Uh, the party is becoming certainly more conservative at the state level. We can see that by looking at party platforms, um, but it's not resulting in a real dramatic uh, shift in gains politically. Uh, you have fits and starts. You'll have um, Bill Clinton, who loses the 1980 re-election bid for governor. Uh, Arkansas voters sort of slap him on the hands and um, give the, the governor's office to a, a man named Frank White, who had recently switched parties to run against Clinton. Um, and like so many Arkansans, Frank White is, a up until that point, a uh, conservative, uh, evangelical, white uh, Democrat right, who switches his party uh, registration and party loyalties and beats Clinton after a quick one term, two term, a two year term uh, effort from White. Clinton uh, again assumes the office and um, for the state's history and, and even presidential history, uh, of course, that is a significant moment in time. But it is also a great illustration of the Republicans maybe making a, a significant gain that's very short lived and then returns back to a status quo that is something almost akin to a, an out of power, almost like a third party uh, status. Um, they are the one of the two parties in the state, but the party is so uh, minimized in most um, cases uh, and, and, and really non-existent in most parts of the state, uh, really up until the, the early 90s, late 80s. And so this first generation closes 
with um, the election of Clinton, um, the Democrat president uh, of the United States. The reason why that's significant to the GOP, perhaps even more so than Democrats in Arkansas, is that that opens up some opportunities for growth. Clinton moves with his fundraising network and takes with him a lot of the younger talent pool of the Democratic Party in Arkansas and takes them to D.C. or um, in some other place um, that is outside of the state of Arkansas. And the, the torchbearer, if you will, um, that assumes the position of governor once Clinton leaves midterm uh, for the White House is a guy named Jim Guy Tucker, who is sort of an heir apparent to Clinton in many ways, but he is very uh, vulnerable. Uh, he is quickly involved in the Watergate investigations and I'm sorry, the Whitewater investigations uh, of the Clinton years. Um, and then later in 1996, after he's indicted, um, has to resign the office and give it over to a Republican. So we'll get to that here a little bit more in a minute. But um, again, fits and starts and kind of happenstance um, seem to be the, 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 the state of the Republican Party. Um, in the 90s and even into the 2000s until more recently, right, where we see these dramatic gains in the Republican Party with the Tea Party movement, uh, uh, racial uh, and other types of resentment to uh, the Obama uh, presidency and so on. So what I want to do is, is sort of go a little more deeper into these eras. Um, and, and I've really already touched on the first generation, so I won't spend much more time on this. Um, but because really my argument is that it's the 1990s where the Republican Party plants seeds that really bear fruit to sustain growth uh, in our current time. And um, that's not to say that, that uh, the 2010, 2012, 2014 election cycles, uh, President Obama, then Trump, and all this stuff would not have happened had it not been for the 90s. But I think the 90s are where we see sustained growth and stability um, and finally a, a more palatable GOP uh, to a state that has long at the, to that point seen a disproportionate number of, of white conservative voters select Democratic candidates. Uh, and so the one significant thing that I've left out to, to this point is the first generation, the, the Arkansas voters uh, overwhelmingly um, create this, this pattern of ticket splitting really before it's cool. Uh, so in the 1960s, they begin uh, to vote for um, first um, sort of a third party candidate in George Wallace in 1968. Uh, and from there, they favor Republican candidates for president of the United States, with exception to Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton. Um, and so Arkansas is at this time somewhat notable in its, its very stark uh, ticket splitting. Um, and, and, and later on, you see, um, even in, in compared to other southern states, as those states have turned more Republican, Democrats uh, remained in control in the state overall, uh, but uh, Arkansas voters were disproportionately favoring Republican presidential candidates. So beginning in 92, 93, the second generation era, you also see open seats created by term limits. So in 1992, voters in Arkansas enact some of the most stringent term limits in the US. Um, there is a court case later that clarifies that Arkansas voters may not in, in, um, enforce term limits upon their U.S. House members, which apparently we tried to do. Um, and, and that, you know, again, leads to early retirements of Democratic uh, members of the General Assembly. It forces some of these legislators to seek higher office probably a little earlier than they would have in their career and creates open seat opportunities for the GOP. Uh, does not this does not lead to a wave of Republican success, but some strategic opportunities for them to pick up a seat every now and then. Um, the, we then have a significant court case, the Republican Party of Arkansas versus Faulkner County. Uh, previous to the mid 1990s, the state of Arkansas uh, charged the parties with funding their own primaries. And so these of course would be set up by filing fees with the parties and this obviously overwhelmingly advantaged the party that had been in power since the end of Reconstruction, the Democratic Party. And so in some cases, uh, you would have one very large spread out rural county that might have one Republican voting site for primaries. And so there's an obvious uh, lack of incentive to vote in a Republican primary in Arkansas, even into the, the 1990s. And it's even harder for the party to recruit uh, candidates to run um, when logistically it's it's almost impossible 
uh, to even get a, a critical number of, of folks to vote in your primaries and in turn to build some data to have a successful general election campaign. So that's a significant um, aid to, to at least creating a more uh, competitive arena for the Republican Party in the state. And then in, in 1996, as I touched on earlier, Mike Huckabee uh, assumes the, the position of governor. Um, he had taken, uh, he had won an emergency election in 1993 for lieutenant governor, uh, a special election after Clinton leaves and the, the, the group kind of shuffles, the constitutional officers shuffle up. Uh, Huckabee wins that race. Uh, is then elected in his own right in 1994 as lieutenant governor, and then in 96 in the summer, very dramatic fashion, um, takes over uh, the governor's uh, mansion uh, when Jim Guy Tucker is indicted for crimes dealing with that previously mentioned investigation and, and has to leave. So what happens though is Huckabee serves for over 10 years, and according to the state constitution, this affords him the ability to make over 300 boards and commission appointments during that time. And he's very unique in this and that he's the only governor who's been in there long enough to make every single appointment to boards and commissions. And so he effectively builds a GOP bench. And when I sat down with him, he said this was the number one um, uh, contribution to his party that he made while in office was just being there long enough to do this. Uh, and I think he articulate, articulated it very well where he said, I was able to put people in positions some hardcore Republicans, many not. Um, and maybe they weren't hardcore Republicans when I left office, but they at least knew that Republicans could govern the state. Uh, this was a state that had not really seen that in, in a long-term fashion. Again, Rockefeller in the 60s serves four total years. White serves a total of two years. So this sustained existence of Mike Huckabee in that office um, greatly elevates um, the, the, at least the comfort levels of Arkansans uh, with Republicans in the state. He leaves office in, in 2000, January of 2007, and, uh, and then we don't see coattails. We don't really see the party build significantly off of his success. Uh, almost like Rockefeller in many ways, he leaves office and then there's really no uh, centralized base of it within the, the state party organization. Now still, you've got a few structural changes in the 90s, and I think they really are significant with term limits uh, primaries being uh, almost automatically uh, more competitive, just uh, or, or at least turnout begins to increase in Republican primaries because of the court case, and then Huckabee being present. But it's it's a short uh, or a long term game rather, not not a, a year in year out. Uh, wow, Republicans are doing great now. Situation in the state, and this this gets us to a point in the literature when if you look at, at Southern politics uh, studies, Arkansas being a border sort of rim Southern state is becoming really unusual. Right. By now, uh, Arkansas is stubbornly Democratic in a sea of, of red around it, uh, by and large. And there's a lot of different reasons for this. One is uh, just the brand loyalty of some really strong, charismatic political figures uh, in the state that had existed in one shape or fashion for up to three decades. Um, the ability of Clinton to um, sort of stave off um, charges by Republicans. The Democratic Party was out of touch with Arkansas values, right? Uh, you have a Clinton that's, that's the titular head, right, of his national party in office saying, well, no, you know me, I'm, I'm the same Bill Clinton. Um, we're, we're not out of touch with you. You've elected me for governor for, you know, over a decade or well, over, give or take a few years, a decade. Um, surely you can be comfortable with Democrats on the ticket. And then you had members of Congress even that continue to get reelected uh, in the state um, with really the same sort of tightrope walk uh, where they, they sort of fashion themselves as something other than uh, Democrats that you would have seen nationally. And then finally, I would argue that Bush in the 2000s, uh, George W. Bush is, is by and large uh, relatively popular in the state. He wins uh, both elections um, in Arkansas in 2000 and in 04. And again, you've got members of Congress who are Democrats who on some of those key issues side with Bush. Uh, and so if you're a voter in Arkansas, you're still very comfortable with the scenario where you vote for Republican candidates for president, but then you have these other people who you know fairly well and you tend to favor them even though they're Democrats. Uh, the state is um, disproportionately white compared to Southern neighbors um, and those voters are more moderate to conservative. Um, and, and so this, this makes the state a noteworthy situation for, for several decades, especially leading up into the 2000s. 
but then everything pretty quickly changes, right? And so I think we could forget some of those those systematic changes, some of those less less than sexy sort of things that happened in the 90s, um, and really fixate entirely on um, President Obama and his his um, lack of of um, support in a state like Arkansas. And, and certainly, it's well documented. There's uh, significant uh, survey data to support as well as electoral uh, data even in, in, in Arkansas uh, to support the notion that race was a significant factor in mobilizing a lot of the opposition to President Obama. In 2008, uh, the Republican Party fails to even run um, a U.S. Senate uh, candidate in a U.S. Senate race in 08. Um, by some accounts, Arkansas in 2008 is, is perhaps the most democratic, certainly not the most liberal, but the most democratic state in the U.S. If you look at top-down support, super majorities in the General Assembly in both chambers, all constitutional offices, uh, three of the four House seats, both U.S. Senate seats. Um, and so it does change dramatically uh, between 08 and 10. And so a lot of people will quickly point out Obama. And I do think there's, there's a lot of evidence to support that. But I argue that what creates the sustained change uh, the sustained growth of the GOP in the state is a little bit deeper than that. For one, there was a great study done by Aldrich and Gomez and, and a few others in 1999 that looks at state party organizations. And so we had some data to look at from 1999 and a colleague and I, Drew Kurlowski, uh, we co-authored a piece on this a couple of years ago, uh, looked at those same state party organizations years later in 2013 and 14. And if we looked at the Arkansas data specifically, we would see that the Republican Party made um, pretty important uh, changes and in, in really professionalized more so uh, their state party organization and also focused um, a great deal more on, on localizing, um, sort of mobilizing county organizations. And Democrats also fared better from 99 to 13 or 14 uh, in terms of professionalization, but the gains really were, were you notice them more notably in the GOP. I think that mattered. I think that helped sustain some growth at the local levels and kind of brought that that fervor upward, uh, if you will, into the state's politics. Um, and then you see the nationalization of politics, right? Um, which we know has been decades in the making. Arkansas had been unique in that it was still very parochial up until very recently. And I do argue that that and, and the fact that finally the Republican Party mainly is sort of posing President Obama's sort of foil, was able to have brand alignment where the wall, if you will, surrounding the state of Arkansas and sort of making these national appeals less effective had broken um, with a series of issues uh, with uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act and other things like this that, that Arkansans really found um, uh, very unfortunate, uh, very much did not, did not like. And that leads to this brand alignment where the National Party, Republican uh, National Party image brand is perfectly aligned with the state's uh, GOP brand where the Democrats who have been making this very awkward walk for decades were no longer able to do it um, with, with President Obama. And, and while race is a significant factor, even setting that aside, if you think about it, if you're an Arkansas voter, if you're one of these white uh, more or less conservative voters who've been voting for Republican candidates for president, but then everybody else, largely Democrats. Uh, president Obama is the first non-Southern Democrat to be elected since 1960, right? So this is a new thing that you're you're seeing. And it, even if you're in some of these predominantly white counties uh, where race has really not been something you've had to wrestle with, uh, you're now having to wrestle with it and, and you might not like it. Um, and so we do see some of the election returns between 10, 12, and 14, where the most dramatic changes in the state occur in the widest counties. Um, so race is a factor, but maybe not so much in the way that we would expect race to be a factor in the Mississippi Delta or the Arkansas Delta. And then finally, uh, independence um, advantaged the GOP rather dramatically over time. So this is some, some great data from the University of Arkansas poll uh, at our flagship institution in Fayetteville by Dr. Janine Perry. Um, so from 99 to 2020 here, we see party ID in Arkansas of those sampled. Uh, and you see it's pretty stable. It's roughly a third going each way up until pretty recently. Um, Republicans, Democrats, independents. There's literature all the way back to the late 60s, early 70s 
that discusses the Arkansas voters desire to be seen as an independent, even if he or she maybe isn't um, in, in, in most political science circles. The red is just indicating the pretty dramatic shift that occurs between 2010 and 2020 in regards to GOP identification in the state, right? From 21 to 40 percent. Um, looking at independent leaners, um, what we see is a follow up question that asks, you know, well, which way do you typically favor uh, Mr. or Miss Independent? What we see is uh, a dramatic uh, shift to favor Republicans. You know, you can go back to 2007, uh, perhaps even 2008 and see roughly the thirds still hold and then it begins to shift more in favor of the Republicans. And I argue the most damning uh, evidence of this is actually among even a smaller subsample, which are those leaners who are likely voters. Uh, and this is where we start to see really stark contrast here, where we're seeing the, the average Arkansas voter, which again is, is a, um, you know, if we're looking at demographics, wider, uh, rural and, and more, um, more conservative, uh, moving dramatically over to the Republican column. And, and I would argue more, maybe even more important than that, staying there, not really moving, not really moving back to being independent or to favoring Democrats. And so the takeaway here is the story of partisan change in Arkansas is, is the story of white conservative voters, right? Finally, uh, moving away from their past loyalties of ticket splitting, supporting Democrats for most state races and even congressional races while advantaging presidential candidates who were Republican. I do think that certainly the data would suggest kind of mixed results here that uh, President Obama uh, and, and the lack of, of support that he had in the state and sort of visceral reaction among a lot of white conservatives in the state led to some of this. Uh, but I do think there's some systematic changes and organizational changes and even just dumb luck, right, in the 90s with Jim Guy Tucker resigning and Huckabee ascending to gov the governor's mansion that led to a sustained growth of what we see today. Uh, in the state of Arkansas. And I do think that this could be expanded more forward, uh, looking at other states that are undergoing partisan change or have already. Uh, sometimes we may be a little quick to point to one thing uh, when there are other factors involved. And with that, I'll, I conclude. Thanks, John. Thank you. Okay, so we have about 30 minutes remaining for Q&A. Uh, it's the, my Q&A on the right side of my screen at the moment is still a spinning wheel. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that as an opportunity, not as a problem, and I'm gonna ask some questions of my own. Um, I'll go, you know, I'll, what I'll do is I'll go in reverse order, actually. Uh, John, the first question is for you, just because it's top of mind since you went last. You talked about sort of the shadow of Bill Clinton in the state of Arkansas. And that that's one of the things that makes the story of Arkansas different than the story of many other Southern states or border states. And the thing that really struck me was that conversation with Huckabee about building the bench. And I was thinking about, is this is something that maybe we could look at systemically, that, that when parties return to power in states, it's because the fundamentals had actually moved first, but they hadn't built their bench yet. I think you're exactly right. Um, you know, one thing that that um, Arkansas was known for, even if you go back to the Southern politics study of VOK, is that the Democratic Party wasn't organized, right? It was it was based on personality and and familial relations and all this nonsense, right? All the kind of things that you would have if you just constantly enjoy a majority. Um, and I think to your point, when Clinton leaves, right, he is is a personal kind of politics. There's a void. There's a vacuum. Uh, Clinton continues to fundraise um, and campaign uh, really pretty hard for Arkansas Democrats over the next decade or so. And still to this day, we'll, we'll show up for some key races, although now um, his, his appeal is not quite what it once was. Um, but what we do end up seeing is, is to your point, the, the Arkansas Republican Party looks more like a party organization or apparatus we would expect, right? If we were teaching a parties class, we would give some variation of what they are uh, and probably not what the Democrats were in the past. I think I think that's a good point. Yeah. Terrific. Um, and as I'm waiting for some questions to pop up, I'll shift now over to Dave Damore. Uh, did we lose Dave Damore? If we lost Dave Damore, I'll just skip over to. You lost me temporarily. Oh, OK. 
So uh, when looking at your uh, sort of addendum to blue metros, red states, um, and you're making these these comparisons to the previous elections. One of the things that struck me is that, you know, 2020 was a weird election in a lot of different ways. And to what extent do you think that you're seeing a continuation of a trend versus there were some idiosyncrasies of 2020? And specifically with these metro shifts in this year, you know, your presidential candidates were about as constant as you could get them. You had the same Republican, then you had Democratic, not a ton of difference there, ideologically, age, anything else. But COVID could have had different salience for urban voters versus rural voters at this point in the pandemic. And do you think that it plays differently toward against an incumbent at that point? I mean, to, to what degree do you think that had something to do with the most recent shift? Um, I don't know if it's so much as COVID as just sort of anti-Trump, right? Um, okay. Right, because you see, you know, my hypothesis is on um, 2018, the Democrats overwin, right? They have so much energy, they, they end up winning places they probably shouldn't. And what I thought was one of the interesting sort of outcomes of 2020 was the level of split ticket voting, right? You see them picking up house seats um, that they probably shouldn't have won two years before, right? Voters sort of going back to that, but not willing to vote for Trump, um, right. So I think that 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 sort of that dynamic is there. And I think, you you know, to the degree that we want to hang a lot on the Virginia outcome, you saw a pretty crafty campaign by the Republican is trying to sort of signal but not embrace Trump, whereas the Democrats that they're building on the sort of California model, this guy's an ex-Trump and voters, they weren't buying that um, on that. And there's not the only reason that was there. Um, you know, I think that the biggest impact on COVID, you know, was the, was just the impact on turnout, right? When you make the process easier to vote, shockingly, more people vote. Um, we saw that in, in Nevada, certainly, and I think you saw that saw that across the, across the board. Um, so the degree that that you make it easier and that's on people's minds, um, clearly, um, I think I think that plays into it. But I think there's just a, a bigger notion of these suburban voters were so sort of put off by so much of Trump's messaging that goes against sort of the metro ethos, um, but that doesn't mean they were running away from the Republican Party. They make that differentiation. Um, so we're kind of interested in this next phase of it to sort of tease that out a little bit is uh, are there sort of things that we can predict where we're going to see suburbs are going to move better targets for one party or the other. We have some thoughts about it, um, but we're kind of that that's the next part of it. I think that'll that'll answer the question. Yeah, great. Um, so continuing to work backwards. Uh, so Michael Bitzer takes on an actually very ambitious project. You you sort of undersold it, and then you were saying, well, you know, North Carolina maybe isn't uh, that projectable and all that. But you know, look, there are, there are plenty of journal articles out there that are looking at just North Carolina. It's such a it's such a perfect laboratory of democracy in a number of different ways because of how it's set up structurally. But and you take on this idea of independent voters, which so often in studies of campaigns and elections, and I, I would group myself among those who mostly dismiss independents as they're all closeted partisans. And you you run contrary to that. And what I'm interested in in, in your discovery so far with this data is these look like disaffected but not disengaged voters. And so I'm going to ask you to speculate if what you're seeing here, are these voters who are transitioning to sort of opting out and out of cynicism? Are these voters who are transitioning into becoming partisans later? Or, or do you think they're durably in this position? Well, that's a great question. I, you know, I, I think part of what we could consider is that these are voters, um, particularly among the registered voters, who are dispositive or, or don't like the party label, but that are perhaps as partisan when they get into the voting booth. Um, you know, where that would go if they would transition from unaffiliated to later status of identifying with a political party. I think we could do that by looking at the generational cohort, particularly millennial voters. Um, I, I think that they're going to be an interesting group to kind of track through 
time with our data sets. Uh, they came into, you know, pretty significant numbers in 2008. They've been playing catch up in terms of some of the turnout dynamics, particularly in 2020. It was boomers, well over 80% was turnout. Millennials and Gen Z's were in the mid to high 50s for their generation. So it, it I'm not trying to avoid your, your question, but I'm just not sure where that dynamic is, is headed with these groups. I think it, it could be one or the other. Um, I, I would probably fall, if it was just me, I would probably fall on the, we don't like the labels, but we are this kind of partisan dynamic. And one of the things that I kind of want to look at is, you know, if we could break, we can break it down by generations within the precincts, is there any patterns of affiliation going on or voting patterns that we could see within those generational dynamics? Um, one of the questions I, I think in the in the chat uh, from Mary Cooper, she asked, I was really surprised to see so many boomers among unaffiliated voters. So what I showed were the consistent unaffiliated voters who joined who, or who were participating in either Democratic or Republican parties consistently 2012, 2016, 2020. Uh, yes, 50% of that 113,000 were boomers. But in looking at, and I just need to flip a uh, Excel chart here, uh, spreadsheet, so, so bear with me. In 2020, among all of the registered unaffiliated, which was 2.4 million, 33% were millennials, 13% were Gen Zs. So, you know, 46% of all the unaffiliated in 2020 were below the age of 40. And so that I think kind of fits into national narratives, particularly by the Pew Research Center and their studies of millennials tending to not like the labels, but it would be interesting to kind of explore where those folks went in terms of picking a political party primary. Yeah, yeah, great stuff. Um, so Anthony, I'm gonna direct one question to you. It sounds like others can view the chat, which unfortunately I can't right now. So what I'll do is I just wanna get in one question over to Anthony and then I'll sort of turn this over into a bit of a free for all. Uh, Anthony, you're, you're sort of barking up a tree that's currently my favorite uh, bone to gnaw on, which is nationalization of politics. And um, one of the things that I was thinking about when I read your paper prior to today was that it's hard to disentangle in many cases these activities of state or local government officials that what they're doing is this as as you want to draw this line that they're doing this with an eye towards the national party and this is towards toward placating or satisfying the national party or are they just doing this out of authentic ideology i think in particular with like covid restrictions and things like that there was the suggestion that they're doing these things because they want to keep themselves in new alignment with the White House, or was this really just their authentic position? Oh, you're mute. There you go. Sorry. Um, you know, I think I honestly, I, th I I do think that that's a great question, and um, you know, one thing I do kind of wonder is, you know, um, so when I when I when in the paper, when I try to incorporate some of the stuff on just the national party organizations, um, I think it's that the uh, you know potentially the, the the fact that it it is partisan, it's competitive. I think in some ways reinforcing some of that ideological divide, and I think the incentive structure is actually kind of set up where it's pushing the two sides apart on this. Um, and also, and also, I think the kind of, especially with with the COVID um, element of this, um, the fact that you know the response, in one sense, right, it seems to incorporate you know a need for cooperation across levels of government, um, but the extent to which some of that you know really was kind of diffuse to the states made things, um, it, it it complicates the issue a little bit. Um, 
because I sort of read, you know, just the response there as I think there is a moment early on where everybody does generally get maybe not on the same page, but they're in the same ballpark um, where almost everybody kind of shuts down and there are kind of a few outliers. Um, it takes a little bit of time for that sort of separation to happen, but it also occurs, you know, in the grand scheme of things, also relatively fast. Um, you know, because you know the, the first movers there to open things up are Republican governors in Republican states. Um, you know, and Democrats seem to kind of be holding on to the lockdown policies, if we want to call them lockdowns for a while. Um, I th you know, so I think in order to probably get uh, to be able to kind of disentangle that a little bit, um, I guess what I probably could do is look at the extent to which. Um, if we can sort of disentangle the early, the states that were really hit early by the pandemic versus not, but there seems to be a big correlation between those two things as well. Um, you know, like, like states in the Northeast seems to kind of had the first wave. Um, so, but uh, well, I guess one other just quick thing on that is um, I think the, the national party organizations, the fact that we have like a Republican Governors Association, so incorporating everyone from around the country. Um, again, this is some of the things I don't know if they start the divide, but I think a lot of the times the party organizations are reinforcing it. Um, because again, the incentive structure in terms of getting out of state resources, um, coordinating on messaging, um, you know, that's promoting, I think, hom homogeneity within the parties, but diver you know, different opinions across them. Um, so again, I don't know if, if if the initial start is partisan versus ideology, but um, I think the parties are reinforcing those those divisions. OK. So again, I'm not seeing the chat right now, so I'm going to if if anyone is seeing a question directed to you or that you think is uh, particularly best for you to answer, please go right ahead because I, I'm not able to view those questions right now. Yeah, if, Dave, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I don't think, oh, uh, there was one that they got it. I had a question for Michael about the North Carolina data. Um, I thought yeah. it was fascinating because we're in the middle of the same dynamic here. Um, we don't track race and ethnicity with our data registration, so it's, <laughs> it's harder to sort of figure that out. So um, do you have a sense, sort of two questions. Um, the first, do you have a sense of these are people moving to the state or are there already people living there? Um, and second, have you seen any effect on the on the um, primaries? Because I, I thought it was interesting that they're allowed to select which primary they want to go to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in our, in our state, it's closed primary, and the real concern is that you're just letting all the ideologues determine the candidates, and that's why you see this sort of back and forth. But if in theory that more open structure should allow for a little more moderation and ultimately, whole, ultimately who advances. Yeah, that, that both great questions. Uh, actually, in the voter registration um, data on the form, they ask for birth state as well. And if the voters respond, we've, we've got a whole host of, of uh, numbers in that regard. My recollection from the data is that they tend to be more out of state than native born. Uh, but again, we're kind of seeing that play out in a generational dynamic as well. So that's going to be something that, that we can certainly dive and, and get more into, particularly if we look at maybe regionalism uh, rather than just individual states. It would be, I think, interesting to see our Southerners who are moving to, to North Carolina versus Northeasterners, Midwesterners, Westerners uh, in that regard. The um, the other question about um, in terms of of the primaries and you had asked about uh, and I just lost my thought in terms of well, what I about mean, the you do does it I mean does it yield more moderation I guess if you're oh yield to, yeah to sort of move, um, pick where they want to go that I, I think maybe if if we could do kind of an isolated poll and ask. The questions of of you know maybe just an isolated set of unaffiliated registered voters to kind of get that I think that would be an interesting tease out. Um, what I have heard and this has been said publicly on a podcast, the uh, former Democratic Party chair in the state. 
has had conversations with colleagues in the legislature and on both sides, both Democrats and Republicans, saying, why do we continue to let unaffiliateds into our party? Maybe we should close off, you know, our, our party primaries to these folks. And his response was, you would be cutting off your nose to spite your face to both, both fellow Democrats and to Republicans. But he has said in the legislature that that among the elites, you know, the, the elected officials, that's becoming a a more, you know, talked about question of whether they should continue to allow um, by party invitation the opportunity for unaffiliated to participate. Now, typically in the party primaries, you know, they're they're anywhere from unaffiliated. If you take all of the voters are typically around 20 to 25 percent of the entire electorate within each party primary. But as their numbers continue to grow, will there kind of be a push among the true partisans to say, look, if you want to be, you know, if you want to play in our sandbox, you have to become one of us in, in that regard. And that that's going to be interesting. Um, one of my colleagues, Whitney Ross Manzo, uh, reminded me to, to look at figure eight in our paper, and they had asked a question, percentage who believe a third party is needed. Uh, in 2021, uh, Democrats said about 47% of Democrats said there needed to be a third party uh, among Republicans. That number was up to 60%. Among unaffiliated, it was 70%. And unaffiliateds have both in 2018, 2019, 2021 been saying the highest number say we need a third party. So that could also kind of get back to 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 the point earlier of, you know, are these disaffected? Are these people that want other options or are they just closeted partisans, you know, not willing to to take on the party label? And I don't see any other questions in the in the Q&A unless somebody else is saying it. it. It's possible that because I have this horrible spinning wheel, I might not be able to like approve the questions. I'm not sure what the mechanics are of this. No, I don't, I don't see anything in there. I, you know, uh, Michael, I, I have another follow up question for you with North Carolina. That that chart that you showed of over time, the you know, the the decline of the openly affiliated, you could call them, and rise of uh, independence. It looks roughly like what we see from like Gallup over time and all that for national samples. Do you have a sense or have you done that comparison of how North Carolina looks versus the rest of the country on this dimension? Like, is it becoming more independent or about the same? I, I would say probably North Carolina is slightly in terms of independence and unaffiliated slightly behind the national dynamic. It would be interesting to kind of have those two lines kind of looking at it. Certainly coming out of the 70s and the 80s, uh, the over, you know, population of registered Democrats, you know, certainly as is, is that dynamic has been trending significantly down uh, over the past several decades as well. Republicans very much kind of consistent at, at that 30% since primarily 2010, 2011. Uh, but it would be interesting to kind of see the national dynamics from Gallup uh, compared to, to the state, and we could easily do that, yeah. And then sort of related, so David, with the, the metro versus rural, uh, is is that primarily being fueled by immigration? Is people, moving, people who are clearly partisans who are moving into the metro centers, or is it that the the environment is causing some policy updating? Um, a little of both, I think. Um, we certainly see, you know, there are a lot, tons of, you know, we were researching the book, it was amazing how many editorials you saw the Texas papers, like all these Californians, make them stop coming. Um, you know, <laughs> that, that was, you know, sort of a study that you see the same thing in Colorado and Denver. Um, and it's obviously fuel that's going on in, our, in, in Las Vegas, right? Uh, Southern Californians, COVID. They're all relocating here for cheaper houses, and now you can't buy a house here. Um, so I think you have some of this sort of movement um, in, say, the Atlanta, a little bit north to south. 
um, on that. But I do think, you know, that, that they're bringing some of their attitudes with them and some of their expectations with them about sort of what, what government is. And I think there's a, there was a book that came out and we referenced in our book about sort of this argument that all these liberals are moving these conservative states. And they're moving here because the taxes are cheap. Uh, the cost of living is uh, less expensive. There's less taxes and they want to impose uh, all those things that are going to make taxes go up. Um, so I think that that's an interesting um, dynamic. The real problem, though, is the reaction through redistricting, um, you know, you certainly see that, and then, you know, this cycle is going to be something like that. The other problem you sort of see um, in a state like Texas is there's just no bench, right? So if there is, there is this idea you can take it. There's there's some you know, momentum perhaps for the Democrats in the Lone Star State. There are only bench, there are only candidates um, to run. I think you're gonna, that's going to be a real dilemma uh, moving forward. And the you know the Republicans are do everything they can through voter access and redistricting to sort of stop that sort of surge there. And then you also clearly see, you know, there's a pushback, not related necessarily to, 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 to uh, voting, but a pushback to urbanization, um, right? So a few years ago the in Arizona, there were a plan to, um, you know, they're moving on the metro there, or they're moving on their light rail there, and the Koch brothers funded a campaign to eliminate the entire light rail funding. Um, and put it in roads. Um, the idea being that we don't want this sort of urban feel out in these suburbs here. It, it lost, um, that, that, that initiative lost, and you know the, 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 the urbanization and the push for the, uh, the light rail continues there. So I think it's playing out a lot of different, different fronts. I mean, the real emphasis of our book is really what's happening within the states for policymaking. The sort of national impact is just a, sort of almost an aftermath or, a, or sort of side effect that they're the swing states that they're deciding thing, but we're really interested in the dynamics of what's going on in policymaking within the states. Uh, great. Other questions from the other panelists to the other panelists. I understand it's very late on the East Coast, so I understand. I, know. I, I, I had a question for Anthony here. Um, you know, moving forward, you know, you've sort of seen this push in response is state legislators trying to strip these elected officials of voting po other powers. Um, do you think that's going to be successful? Do you think it's going to have major implications for how elections run, or is it just some sort of reactive thing in the short term? Um, I hope it's a reactive thing in the short term. <laughs> um, yeah, oh, that, I mean, that's a, just a, that's a great question. Um, yeah, this is also one of those things where I'm not always necessarily sure what the effect of just changing some of the stuff would you know would necessarily do if we're going from sort of a i think you know it matters i think if you go from like a nonpartisan administrative type post to um you know you know somehow you know a partisan legislature or something you know you know basically inserting themselves afterwards and being able to kind of rule um you know on maybe specific issues whether it's contested ballots or something um but I get, uh, at this point, I, I, let me just, I guess, reiterate, I hope it's a short term reaction to stuff. I hope it's, it doesn't get to the point where, you know, uh, the rules of the game can be something at the beginning of the set cycle and then after the votes counted, they can retroactively change them. Like, you know, like, let's just hope we never get to that. So I'll say we had an interesting dynamic. You know, the only statewide elected official is a Republican, <laughs> is the Secretary of State, um, and she was ended up being censored by her own party after the election. Um, yeah. yeah. The, you know, administering the election and you know saying that the challenges that were coming daily were just ridiculous. Um, and you know, she's termed out, so she won't run again. But I'm interested to see what happens when these folks go on, you know, run for re-election or try to move to another office. If this sort of baggage is used against them um, as a sort of campaign issue. Um, it'd be interesting to see. Yeah, I mean, just a quick note on that too, just because you reminded me of that case. Um, you know, I think part of it might just depend on, you know, who's winning the primaries in some of these states for those, you know, for you know, some of these elected offices, you know, for a uh, you know, state attorneys general or, or a you know, secretary of state or something, you know, if, you know, a more extreme candidate can win and then get through a general election contest that potentially could matter in, in a case where the election is actually contested. Um, so, you know. And then you throw in like an elected Supreme Court and watch out. 
<laughs> All right. Well, uh, seeing nothing else across the uh, panel here, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. So I want to thank all of the four panelists who came on to present their papers today. And thanks also to the, the other co-authors who were not able to join us. We wanted to keep things to one author each. And we will be coming back tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Eastern. That's 7 a.m. for those of us on the West Coast. And we will be doing this all again tomorrow. So thank you, everyone. And we'll see you again tomorrow for day two of State of the Parties. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.